You're listening to 94.4 FM, South City Radio, the Friday Sports Show with your host, Jim Petruzzi, bringing you all the news from the local area and around the world. The goal of the show, or at least some of the goals of the show, is to increase awareness and participation of different sports. We bring you some of the world's best athletes, sports people, coaches, people who work in sport in various uh, fields, from psychology all the way through to performance. But we also have a segment where we interview some of the most influential people in the world of psychology and mental health and related fields too. So they've provided us with some really fascinating insights into the research and, and what they do professionally. Today we have a really interesting guest um, in the field of performance psychology. It's, it's a huge um, variable in sport as we know and we've spoken to guests over the past um, you know, few years and uh, our various guests um, who've been involved in, in the mental side of the game. And I think today will be a really interesting interview for us to sort of get more of an insight into sort of what goes on in the performance psychology role. So today we have a very special guest, Sarah Murray, who's a woman's senior performance um, psychologist at Brighton Hove Albion Football Club. So welcome to the show, Sarah. Great to have you on board. Hi, how are you? It's nice to be here. Yeah, that's no, really great to have you on board. So I suppose we can sort of start from the beginning for our listeners in terms of what was your motivation, Sarah, to go into performance psychology? Um, yeah, at the risk of sounding really cliched, um, I, I am essentially your, your typical um, failed performer and athlete, if you like. Um, when I reflect back on my own experiences um, as an athlete, uh, as a hockey player, um, when I was younger, uh, I, I was always fascinated by the fact that I would I would train really well and in big match moments or, or, or big moments where there were selection processes to, to match the squad and etc. Um, I, I would never quite be there performance-wise. Uh, and it just sparked something in me years later, actually, in my late 20s, um, as to really delving into why that was and, and the mental side of the game and the psychology around that. Um, so I, I guess that sparked my interest um, after I'd uh, actually gone into a career in PE teaching. Um, and it was after eight years of teaching that I did a master's in sports psychology and just was uh, inspired, fascinated by it. Yeah. It's my own and to take it further. That's really interesting you say, and I suppose one thing that I would find interesting, you mentioned yourself as a performer. I suppose this is you know, a very difficult question to, to, to answer in terms of you know, there's a lot of variables involved in, in you know, um, sport, but do you think, had you have had someone like yourself, do you think you would have um, achieved more than, than you wanted to? I mean, obviously things work out for a reason, but what, what do you think would have could have been different if, if you were able to sort of transfer the knowledge you have now to uh, younger self when you were a performer? Yeah, that, isn't that just like the golden question, isn't it? Um, I mean, I'd, I'd love to say that, you know, if I had some sports like support when I was younger, then I would have absolutely represented my country and wanted to be Olympics. I can't say that. Who knows? Yeah. However, I do think that if I had just had an awareness and an understanding of how to actually develop my psychology, my performance psychology, and understanding around mentality and impact it can have, um, it definitely would have benefited me massively. And not just benefited me in terms of you know, dealing with pressure on a pitch or, or working through um, confidence and, and things where, as a, an athlete, but actually it really would have benefited me outside of, of sport as well, definitely. That, that understanding of performance psychology, of, of stepping up with big moments, of, you know, how and why we, we think how we do and react to the way we do in certain situations. Um, hindsight and age is a wonderful thing, um, but I really think it would have, would have supported me in that way. Yeah, interesting you say, and, and I think that, you know, obviously what we sort of, um, what we sort of, the transferable skills that you get from, from learning and, and just sort of, I know it's difficult to sort of, you know, once again to, to, to sort of suggest where the skills could be transferred, but just generally speaking, these sort of skills, where else can they be transferred, do you think, in say, you know, is it possible to transfer these skills in academia, in, in business, in life in general, just day-to-day -day living, sometimes it can be sort of challenging as well. Do you sort of see a place for these skills also, you know, being outside sport as well? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think safe to say that actually every one of us, we are performing 
every day of our lives, whether we are performing the role of a, of a worker in the job that we do, performing as a parent, uh, performing in terms of the more traditional senses of sport, the arts, business, right? the performance is, is something that is asked of all of us on most given days. So to understand a little bit more around the psychology of that, why it is that some days we can turn up and we can absolutely smash it and feel great and so well. Some days it, it really doesn't and we might struggle and that's a lot of well-being around the it, It's really valuable um, across so many sectors. Um, so the, the fact that, that I work specifically in sport is, is a choice that, that I've made, but everything is very accessible in terms of you know, life skills and, and the lessons that will go on to just create uh, a like, better understanding of mental well-being and performing just generally in life. Absolutely, yeah, no, absolutely. That's sort of, that's really, you know, an interesting sort of take take away in terms of we are performers on a day to day basis, and you know, whether we're a lecturer at, at a college or uni, or you know, working in sales or, or a parent, like you said, I think that it's it's one of them where, you know, we, we we sort of one of the key things in life is being able to have our sort of you know game head on for one of a better word, really. At certain times, it's not always easy. Um, in your own role itself, I mean, at, at sort of uh, you know at, at Brighton, can you tell us a bit of a, a bit of an insight into like what that involves for our listeners? What does the performance psychologist do uh, in the world of football? Um, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so I've been working in professional football now for my eighth season. Uh, previous to that, I ran my own business and worked across lots and lots of different sports. Um, and in terms of what a day to day looks like for psychologists, I think it, it's nothing like I would have imagined. When I was fresh faced out of the masters, I thought, you know, I'd be maybe sitting in a room talking with an athlete, you might be doing mental skills, you might be doing traditional imagery or visualization or what have you, and then he or she may step onto a quarter of pitch and then they use this and, and and I guess that the reality is incredibly different than I think it's shifted massively over the last decade. Um, so day to day for me, at, at the moment, for example, if I describe yesterday, so I now work with the um, women's WSL with Premiership. So I work alongside Hope Powell, who is our manager at Brighton Albion head coach. Sorry, um, and in the morning the, the team were training, so I'm in I'm in kit, put my boots on, um, all weathers. It was flipping cold yesterday, and uh, I was out on pitch. And, and out on pitch is involved in lots of discussions and work through the FC and support staff, physio, support therapists, the coaches, um, just observing the girls. Uh, if there are any particular players that I'm working with on, on certain areas of their game, it might be that, that I make observations around you know, what that looks mm. like in training for them. Likewise with coaches, um, I work very much uh, staff facing these days and working with and through coaches and support staff. So it's the morning on pitch, it's an afternoon back in the office, seeing the players one to one for general check in. Um, it was a, a group session where, whereby we're doing a, a piece of work around monitoring cognitive fatigue and mental fatigue, not just how physically fatigued players are. So it was some admin and, and some research stuff around that in the afternoon. It was um, a, another Zoom or Teams meeting, and I'm sure you're listening to it very familiar with what, yeah, yeah. what those are like. Um, and, and so, you know, day, day to day, it really is um, a real mix of work that supports well-being and performance. So at any given moment, I'll be working from, from one or the other angle, performance into well-being or well-being performance, um, depending on who I'm working with and what perspective. Yeah, that's really interesting stuff. And I suppose for our listeners or anyone sort of contemplating going into career, um, into performance psychology, so really interesting insight um you know it sounds to me um sarah there's no sort of two days the same in terms of your work would, would that be sort of i mean obviously there's no two days the same yeah. in general but the, 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 it seems to me it's quite a versatile role mm. yeah it's um professional sports or just sports in general it's fast paced fast high pressure um it's it's really really exciting um it requires an unbelievable amount of that adaptability and, and flexing into different spaces um, because what's really important as whether you're a performance psychologist or you're a physio, you're a coach, 
is that actually nobody is working in silo. So mm. we're, we're certainly far beyond, certainly in Brighton, we're far beyond the days of, you know, Johnny or Jesse has got a, got a problem that their emotional control is not good enough. Right, send them to the site. Um, we are working in a really collaborative fashion whereby as staff we work into this and, you know, we work together um, to support performance rather than just working in silos. So every single day is different. Um, every single piece of work or conversation I would have will have um, a, a, a different context, whether it's um, psychological support back to um, fitness for injured players, whether it's working with, the, with and through the coaches on elite performance culture and a more kind of, um, organizational and cultural psych piece of work that we um, or whether it is your, your more traditional, I guess, sitting down and working one to one with a player based on what's going on for them, which which very often isn't always about the performance phase. Um, it may well also be about um, you know, the human, because they're human first and sort of a second. Mm, that's really interesting stuff, and I suppose sort of you, you mentioned obviously working in, in in the game in the women's game, and yeah, women's football's come a long way in in, in England, that's for yeah. sure. Um, you know, comparatively to sort of obviously the you know the, the USA has always been up there, and but we've seen the game make giant strides, and, and hopefully it continues to make giant strides, and it keeps getting the coverage uh, to, to to get out there. And what's your sort of perception? You've worked obviously across different sports and in and, and different codes, and how do you sort of see? Um, I, I know this has been a difficult one with sort of the pandemic, and and, and perhaps. Um, it's been challenging, not just for you know women's football, yeah. for sport in general. But how do you see the sort of the health of the game of, of women's football in the UK at the moment, from your perspective, uh, Sarah? Um, well, I, I think probably the the proof in terms of my perspective is is the fact that in, in July of this year, when I was offered the role to to lead the women's 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 uh, and we're actually working with the men's first team on and off through bits and pieces over the years. Um, actually, I think it's a testament to where the women's game is going that I saw that as the most exciting opportunity to step into a world that is evolving so, so quickly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it's continuing to evolve at a rate of not. So, you know, July of this year, when, when that was an opportunity uh, presented to me, I jumped at it. Um, hoping that it would be everything that actually so far it turned out to be in terms of um, the, the performance levels, in terms of the, the, uh, kind of the structural organisation around the women's game and all our, all our females, our, our full-time professionals, the standards and expectations are absolutely in line with my experiences working, working with the men's game, um, as I, I hoped and I thought they probably would be. So it's really exciting um, mm. and I think it's it's a game that in time to come we will see more and more coverage uh, in the media, more and more of it, of it being actually on a, on a par with the men's game in terms of TV rights, in terms of wages, in terms of more, more full-time uh, WSL uh, teams. You know, we'll get to a point, I hope, one day where um, WSL 1 and 2 and championship will have to be, they will all be full-time. Yeah, and that's, that's interesting you say that... Uh... The the, 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 the the professional the 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 actual game is professional at that sort of level and um, do you think that makes a huge difference for the players Sarah to be professional to train every day and just focus on their game and not have to sort of like you know you know work at yeah. a nine to five or, or whatever during the day and do training in the evening do you see from your perspective a huge difference in development and the ability to sort of be the best you can be by training every day? Yeah, as, I mean, it would be really difficult for me to, to comment on, on historically what it was like sort of three, four years ago when when um, the women said that Brighton wasn't full time because it wasn't full time I worked in. But my understanding is that actually for, the, for these women to have, have, have come through maybe a, as part time as part time players in years gone by and, and to be offered full time contracts a couple yeah. of years ago be professional is a massive transition and, and a really positive one, but not without some challenges. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, it's a challenge for anybody to transition from, you know, maybe working a job and then training to then transition into that professional athlete mentality, the, the physical demands of it, the expectations 
performance expectations, which year on year on year are just rising. Um, certainly at Brighton, you know, the performance standards and expectations are, are rising um, every season gone by. Um, we have ambitions to be more than just a, a top floor four club, you know, to be top four at some point in time with them. Mm. To win the WSL, to get into Champions League. So um, it, it's certainly um, really exciting for the girls and and something that is going to become more and more the norm, we'd like to think. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And how how sort of the, the 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 city of Brighton sort of embraced the football team? Obviously, Brighton's a you know, it's a nice area, and 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 you know you've had the men's football there, and um, you know they've done well the last you know few years. They've done they've done really well. You know, all things considered, in in terms of obviously, you know, it's it's, it's tough football's a very tough competitive league to play in the Premier League. And how's the sort of uh, city? Embrace the the women's team uh, in in general. Uh, do you think, Sarah? Yeah, I, I think the, the the privilege and and the reason that actually I've said so many times at the time at this particular football club is that Brighton, what we do incredibly well is make sure that everything is balanced. So you know, the women have their own social media, Twitter accounts. They'll have their own, their own Instagram is launched, I believe, coming. Um, you know, the, the media coverage and the the, the values based on, on the women within Brighton as a female first team, is incredibly high. Um, so therefore, actually, the, the fan base is growing. Um, and, you know, when we do advertising campaigns with, with one of the men's first team players, you know, premiership player, there'll also be a, a parallel campaign or, or actually it'll be in conjunction with one of the female first team players. Um, so therefore, there's always this sense that when we talk about first team at Brighton, actually, we could be talking about the men or the women. Um, and so that in itself has helped the fans engage with the women's game. Um, and as soon as we can have crowds back, which hopefully, you know, we'll be well here today, early mm. December, maybe in a few weeks' time, um, you know, it, the, the crowds at, at the stadium where the girls play are, are, are fairly healthy and looking to be grown in the future. Mm, absolutely, and I mean this being a pre-record, obviously at the moment, um, as it stands at the moment, there's, we sort of have restrictions. And but like he says, I mean hopefully in the future when you know restrictions uh, ease at some point, then the crowds and um, that I suppose means a lot. I suppose from a performance psychology point of view, this is the sort of question I'd be interested to sort of see your take on on Sarah in terms of what 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 do you think? I mean in terms of how, what's it like to play for a footballer? Um, Without the, I know it's hard to speak. Every footballer is differently, but what what do you sort of see the difference for a footballer? You know, is sort of playing without the crowd. Uh, some may thrive, some may not. But what's your sort of take on um, there not being a crowd from a performance point of view uh, for for a footballer? Um, there's, there's no question in my mind that it will have an impact. Um, you know, now. The impact it has on each individual player will be very much down to his mentality or her mentality and the way in which they process that. You know, so there will be players that, that see it as a real kind of a real kind of threat, I guess, to performance in terms of um, perhaps they're, they're a player that, that relies on the boost that the crowd can give them, you know, the, the shouting and the, the cheering. Um, but equally, there will be players that will see it as a real opportunity to play without distractions because there are some players that, that find it incredibly difficult to manage crowd noise, be it positive or negative crowd noise. So therefore, there'll be players that, that respond really well and actually mm. thrive under this kind of um, having less noise, if you like, coming into their, their mindset, their mental head button, some um, distractions. But definitely there, there is an impact um, and, and more broadly speaking, I guess you could argue that it's, it's a negative impact for some people, from people's perspective, um, to not have that, that cheering and jeering um, and, and to have that as, as motivational. Kind of mm. Something that drives them on. Um, and and the, the atmosphere has changed. You know, the atmosphere of the game, you know, for players, certainly the terms of the men, so playing from the case to altitude of the fans, the atmosphere of an empty stadium, um, whilst it's taking them, you know, they're, they're getting used to it perhaps now, but it's so daunting start off with when you're uh, thousands of people shouting and cheering and the vibe of match day and the hype of match day is very much, you know, the crowd is massive. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and, and it's really interesting you say. I mean, obviously, I, I would uh, there'd probably be certain players that that even if there was, if they were playing in front of eighty thousand people, they probably would not as so focused on what they're doing as well. And it's it's one of them really. It's all individual. That's really interesting insight. You know, definitely for our listeners to sort of. It's it's obviously been you know we watched the games. We sort of used to seeing the sort of fans and from watching it from on, on TV is one thing and, and but being in a stadium when a game's going on with no fans must be a different feel altogether. Uh, this is obviously outside the scope of, of sort of your, I mean, the, 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 the remit to a point in terms of, you know, looking at things at, at a sort of, at a, at a, at a wider level. Um, you know, the Women's World Cup, um, uh, the next Women's World Cup is, is in Australia. And it would mean, obviously, you know, a, a big, for any country that wins, it, it has a massive knock-on effect in terms of the game. Do you, yeah. do you think that England can... Um, I mean, they came close to getting over the line in the last World Cup. Um, do you think it's possible from what you see, and you've got a lot of knowledge of sport and you've you know been around the game for, for a while, do you think England can go that next step, the league developing and, and, and looking around to, to maybe win a World Cup? I think um, one of the keys to, to answering that is actually what you just mentioned, which is the league development. So, so for as long as there is there's development in terms of um, the money being fixed in WSL football, um, the level of professionalism, being able to become full-time professionals. Um, it, it's only going to it's only going to support uh, the standard of, of players that, that we have in this country and the standard of homegrown players and homegrown rules changing and the next couple of seasons and having homegrown players within the WSL team. So therefore. Could argue, you know, could argue definitely that it, it's going to have an impact, a potentially positive impact, on the national squad and on the national team, um, combined with, with you know, positive media coverage um, and increasing the value that, that Joe, Joe Blanc and the everyday public places on women's football. Um, so, it, uh, who knows is the answer. We don't have a crystal ball, yeah, but yeah, yeah. like to think that we're heading in a, a positive direction. Yeah, and I think, you know, just as important, I mean, you made some really great points there, and I think it's, it's just as important. One of the aims that we have on the show certainly is, you know, policy makers and people listening in and to just show how important, um, you know, sport is and, and obviously women's sport and women's football is, you know, really important. We've seen the big strides it's made over the years and we've seen, that you know, the obviously, you know, pre-COVID, the, the stadium's full and, and, and we've seen the TV coverage too, so... As well as obviously the team, the national team doing well, participation is is, is a big thing as well, and you know encouraging yeah. um, you know uh, women to get involved in the game um, at all yeah, levels. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, for sure. Definitely, and and so I mean, in terms of say playing for a professional team, obviously, what, what's what's it like in terms of the obviously in the men's game, you know, there's a development program and. You've got the centre of excellence at the academies, and uh, that can feed through into the first team. And, and you know, some teams obviously go out and buy players, and um, and yeah. you know, and that, how's it work in terms of the um, the, the women's game, um, the development program? Is, is there a pathway to get yeah. to the first team? Yeah, absolutely. And I think again, this is so. I mean, I, I know the men's game. I know the men's game incredibly well in terms of. Um, you know, working in a, in a Category 1 academy, working in a, in a premiership men's environment um, and the pathways in. Um, and part of, part of the attraction of, of moving over into the women's game was the fact that, that I, I know as well that the pathway is parallel. Um, it, it looks slightly different, um, but we would have a, a pathway no different to, to the boys' academy. Um, we would have something called the RTC, Mm-hmm. So an RTC is a, a regional talent centre, um, and that would be um, under sixteen girls all the way down to so under sixteen, under sixteen, twelve, what have you. Um, and so girls would come in into that, and the, the training, the difference, I guess, between um, the RTC at Brighton and the boys' academy would be that the boys' academies are um, they're in during the day, so there are certain certain school days they might miss the train during the day, and the RTC is still even, even they came out to the um, 
and want to, want to play as tr transitions and progressive for our RTC, they would move into the DCA. Um, the DCA is a, a dual careers academy. So the DCA is looking at, at players post-16 who are, who are um, talented and we want to keep, keep in the pathway mm. and, and actually support them in their education. Um, you know, maybe doing a degree, going to college, what have you, but also playing football uh, to, to a, an elite standard. Because ultimately, you know, we're talking about elite sport. Um, mm. Because they are in, they are in the same position as the boys in the academy are. They are looking to transition into the full time professional um, football in the Premiership. Um, and then, yeah, absolutely, much like the, the men's under twenty threes, our DCA girls would would be um, a pool of, of talent, I guess, that we would want to draw up as the, the women's first team. Um, and actually, we have a, a couple of players that made debuts in the WSL from our DCA this year. Um, and so we're really massive on on that homegrown talent um, mm. in a similar way to working in the men's side. So um, apart from, uh, I guess, the organisation of it and starting on what has not been there yet, um, it's very similar. Yeah, it's interesting stuff. And in terms of, you mentioned there the education, um, is it the same in, in yeah. the women's game? So is it similar in the women's game, the education where they, they do um, they do uh, like, a, like studies as well, Sarah, or is that... Yes, yes, they do. So ed education continues the, the whole way through, as it, as it would do, as it would do for, the, for the academy boys up until up until eighteen, yeah. certainly. Um, after which, it, it generally is um, the choice. I guess the, the difference I'm noticing is that um, if I think about uh, working with under twenty three, generally they're full time, they're full time professionals, and and they generally speaking don't necessarily continue education. Um, so they'll do it up to eighteen, but, but then. Yeah, no, absolutely, and that's you know interesting uh, how that sort of works. And you know, for our listeners, obviously, it's this really interesting insight in terms of how the development and the opportunities for homegrown players. I mean, everyone, every fan likes homegrown players getting through the first team. It's a, it's a massive buzz, and when we sort of see you know a player uh, that sort of come through the ranks for, for any city, really. And sort of moving forward, I know obviously it's a collective effort, and 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 I'm sure there's you know certain things in terms of aspirations that you guys have got that you sort of you know may may sort of keep in in house but you mentioned earlier about sort of you know the desire to sort of to to get out there and, and the champions league and do things and i mean in terms of um what, sort of what what's the vision sarah what can you sort of share with our listeners in terms of the vision for brighton uh i, I no doubt yourself you've got a winning mentality you, you'll be looking to sort of get the very most out of every player and go as far as you can but do you the guys like have a long term plan and, and you have to sort of share what you, what's yeah. sort of in house? But is there sort of a, a a vision for for Brighton to be up there with 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 the very best in 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 the uh, in Europe? We would have absolutely. We would have we would have a long term vision and, and plans. And you know we're we're in the game to to be as successful as, as possible. You know, sport is um, it's about performance. It's you know results do matter. Um, and, and the journey, the journey is one that we're currently on um, to, to do as, as well as we can over the, over the coming years. And, and of course, that comes with, with strategy that, that would come from the top and, and planning and you know, how that's going to look and how it's going to happen. Um, and, and it's exciting just at the moment, certainly for me personally, to, to be in, in working with the girls and the women's first staff um, uh, on that journey to, to just being, being better on year on year on year. Yeah, no, definitely, and it's a journey that we certainly, you know, wish you every success, and we'll certainly keep an eye out to see how how the team goes. Uh, that's for sure. It's it's interesting, you know, been really interesting and fascinating speaking to you, uh, Sarah. I know that the listeners have really, um, you know, had an interesting insight into into what sort of your role is and 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 the women's game in general, really going forward. And um, I suppose from from my perspective, it's sort of you know, shows how far the game is going and people like yourself involved um, in the game um, that provide, obviously, the expertise you do, uh, you know, certainly demonstrates that the game is moving along uh, rapidly and, 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 and sure, I'm sure we'll continue to do so. So thanks for joining us on the show, Sarah. It's been great speaking to you. 
Um, yeah, pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks very much. So, was Sarah Murray, uh, performer psychologist, the women's senior performer psychologist at Brighton Home and Hove Albion, giving us a really informative and interesting insight into her role, but also the women's game in general on the Friday Sports Show, 94.4 FM, South City Radio, if your host, Jimmy Petruzzi.